Welcome to NTD News. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at today's top stories. President Biden visiting the site of the deadly condo collapse in Florida to offer condolences to family members. And residents' lawyers take action. What do they want? Election integrity bills in Pennsylvania and Arizona met with setbacks Wednesday. One came at the hands of a Democrat governor's veto, while the other resulted from infighting among Republicans. Trump's company and its executive are said to have been indicted in a tax probe. Criminal charges are expected against the company today, but will Donald Trump himself be charged? Former U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld dies at the age of 88. He is known for his role in the Iraq War. He served under Presidents George W. Bush and Gerald Ford. Sources tell the Associated Press that former President Donald Trump's company and CFO have been indicted. The charges stem from a New York investigation into the Trump Organization's business dealings. Entity's Jason Perry is at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Jason, what details about the indictment can you give us? Well, Kevin, we are here in Lower Manhattan outside of the Manhattan DA's office and criminal court building. Around 6 this morning, a top Trump executive turned himself in to authorities. He and other officials of the Trump Organization are expected to appear in court this afternoon. The Trump Organization says the executive is being used as a pawn in what they call a scorched earth attempt to harm the former president. Alleged tax violations. That's what the charges in the indictment against the Trump Organization and the company's CFO, Alan Weiselberg, are expected to involve. Those are related to benefits that top executives in the company received. And it could even include the use of cars, school tuition, and apartments. That's according to two anonymous sources from the Associated Press. The Wall Street Journal first reported that on Thursday, charges are expected. A source told Reuters that the charges are expected to come from Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance. Trump's lawyers said the charges would be related to taxes and other benefits, but that Trump himself would not be charged. A lawyer for Weiselberg, Cyrus Vance's office, and lawyers from the Trump Organization didn't immediately offer comments. A former prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office said one possible charge could be schemed to defraud. Trump issued a statement on Monday calling the prosecutors biased and said that his company's actions were in no way a crime. Back to you, Kevin. All right. Well, President Biden is visiting the site of the condo collapse in Florida today. He and the First Lady are there to offer condolences to the families of those killed and missing. And today's Jessica Beatty reports. President Biden and the First Lady headed to Florida Thursday morning to visit the site of the deadly condo collapse. They're offering condolences to family members. On Wednesday, the confirmed death toll rose to 18. And two of these were children, aged four and 10. The children were identified as four-year-old Emma Guara and 10-year-old Lucia Guara. Their parents are also confirmed dead. And rescue crews have been searching for a week now. Last Thursday, Dr. Howard Lieberman was in surgery when he got the call to come and help. I've been a trauma surgeon for around 11 years, and uh, this has been emotionally the most difficult thing I ever had to endure. No one's been pulled out alive since the early hours of the disaster. Over 140 people are still missing. Everyone that's here is fully dedicated to this operation, to this mission, and we are working 24-7, and we haven't taken a break, and we will not take a break until every last stone is removed. And a federal agency said Wednesday is going to investigate the collapse. The National Institute for Standards and Technology is a small agency within the Commerce Department. This will be a fact-finding, not fault-finding, technical investigation. It will take time, possibly a couple of years, but we will not stop until we have determined the likely cause of this tragedy. This is only the fifth time it's launched an investigation into a structural collapse. And some residents have filed a class action lawsuit. Their lawyer says they've been raising concerns about the building for years. In photographs, in video, she's been saying the building is falling apart. She has video of the garage. There's dripping on her car. Every week, her and her friends are complaining, and nobody listened to her. And the warning signs were there. And we're going to get to the bottom of who was responsible. Another lawyer filed an emergency motion Wednesday to allow an observer and drone to document evidence on site. He says families have no idea whether it's being documented and they deserve a voice in the process. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Arizona's election integrity efforts suffered a setback when two Republican senators clashed over amendments to a bill. And in Pennsylvania, Democrat Governor Tom Wolf vetoed a Republican-backed election integrity bill. 
An election integrity bill in Arizona lost a vote in the Senate over a split within the Republican Party. Republican State Senator Kelly Townsend added several amendments to an election integrity bill that passed in the House. Republican Senator Michelle Ugenti Rita came out against that version of the bill. Townsend responded to Ugenti Rita's no vote by blasting her on the Senate floor and on Twitter. Townsend says Ugenti Rita is siding with Democrats by blocking important election security measures. Ugenti Rita tells the Epoch Times that Townsend has a personal vendetta against her and she's acting angrily and unprofessionally. Ugenti Rita says she wants to craft an election reform bill the right way and with the support of the caucus. In Pennsylvania, Governor Tom Wolf vetoed an election integrity bill that included a voter ID requirement along with other election security reforms. The conservative policy group Heritage Action sharply criticized the governor's veto. The group's director, Jessica Anderson, said voter ID requirements are a common sense first step to protecting our elections. They are supported by 74 percent of Pennsylvania voters. A recent Monmouth University poll says 62 percent of Democrats, 87 percent of independents, and 91 percent of Republicans support some form of voter ID. Pennsylvania Republicans plan to put voting ID directly to voters using a ballot measure. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. The Supreme Court rules that Arizona's ban on ballot harvesting and out-of-precinct voting does not violate federal law. The case has implications for future elections. The court opinion split along ideological and partisan lines. Six conservative justices voted to uphold the state law, and the three liberal justices voted to strike it down. It reverses a previous ruling by an appeals court. The court judged that Arizona laws do not violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The court also found that the ban was not enacted with a racially discriminatory purpose. The Biden administration previously sent a letter to the court to acknowledge the Arizona laws were not at odds with federal law. And on Capitol Hill, House Democrats brought a new infrastructure bill to the floor. The Democrat-backed bill includes many of President Biden's priorities, such as moving towards net zero emissions and replacing lead pipes. NTD's Melina Wisecup has more details. The House is starting debate on a new infrastructure bill, $715 billion dedicated to surface level transportation. That's roads, bridges, railways, and waterways. A lot of it goes right along with what President Biden proposed in his infrastructure plan. Let's take a closer look at what House Democrats are proposing in this new bill. Around half of the total price tag is set to fund hard infrastructure. This includes $32 billion for bridges. But it also includes $4 billion for electric vehicle charging stations, $8 billion to reduce carbon pollution, and $3 billion to reconnect communities divided by, quote, planning mistakes of the past. To take uh, the transportation and infrastructure mark well beyond what our bills every few years have done in the past. They also want to invest more in public transportation, increasing public transit by 140 percent. The goal is to pilot public transit programs for child care, pickup and drop offs, grocery store trips, etc. Committee Chairman Peter DeFazio says the U.S. built around 35,000 miles of highway in the past 20 years. And guess what? Congestion is six times worse. That is not the solution. So we're going to make states look at alternatives, rail, transit, microtransit, all the other things that can work. They're also pushing for water infrastructure, like replacing lead pipes. And $8 billion would fund two permanent programs to help low-income Americans pay for their water bills. And $4 billion to cancel Americans' water bill debt since March 2020. This wipes out their debt, and then it has a five-year uh, sh uh, no shutoffs. Um, and then assistance program. The level of eligibility, you know, poverty level, whatever, depends on the states. On the House floor Wednesday, some Republicans pushed back on the bill. One out of every two dollars spent in this bill is tied up in Green New Deal priorities. He also says the proposed clean energy policies would make way for a total ban on fracking and cost more job loss, like what happened with the Keystone XL pipeline. But the chairman says this deal could replace those jobs lost in the pipeline cancellation. I'm putting $5 billion a year into wastewater, and every billion creates 20,000 jobs. The chairman says he hopes these ideas can be the policies within the framework of that new bipartisan infrastructure deal that was just negotiated between a group of senators and the White House. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. 
20 Republican governors sent a letter to President Biden Tuesday urging him not to add to the number of justices on the Supreme Court. The governors say the court is needed to protect citizens and states from federal government overreach. They say the court needs to stay free of political pressure and shielded from partisan power grabs. In the letter, they say that one round of court packing will lead to another whenever there is a change in power. The governors say that if this is allowed to happen, the Supreme Court will lose its role as an independent branch of government and its ability to provide checks and balances. Some Democrats and liberal activists say the Supreme Court is too conservative. They've called on the Senate to add four more justices. A brand new Statue of Liberty has arrived from France. It's going to be on display in New York for Independence Day. NTD's Arian Pastar is on Ellis Island for the installation. Arian, what can you tell us about Little Lady Liberty? Well, Kevin, I can tell you that the name Little Lady Liberty is quite fitting because as you can see, this new statue here is only nine feet tall compared to the older one, which is of course over 300 feet tall. But they do have some similarities. One of them being is that they both came from France. So just like its bigger sister, the Little Lady Liberty also was shipped from France all the way to New York. Now, as a matter of fact, it just arrived yesterday and it's being set up and inaugurated here today on Ellis Island, which is right next to Liberty Island, where the big Statue of Liberty is standing. Now that's one similarity. Another one is the material they're made from, which is copper. Now you might think, why does the new statue not have this kind of greenish color that we know from the other statue? And so here's the fun fact, Kevin. The other statue wasn't green either when it first arrived in the United States. It actually turned green over time due to corrosion. Now we talked to the French ambassador to the US and we asked him, why is the US getting a new Statue of Liberty at this time? And he said it's just to express friendship and to show that there are two countries celebrating their freedoms together. Now the statue arrived right before the 4th of July. It's going to stay here for a week to celebrate the 4th of July. And after that, it's going to be sent to Washington DC where it's going to stay for good. Kevin. All right, and the New York State Assembly will soon issue subpoenas as part of its impeachment investigation into Governor Andrew Cuomo. The announcement was made by State Assemblyman Charles Levine. He heads to the body's Judiciary Committee and heads the panel conducting the investigation. He said the committee will issue subpoenas to get documents and sworn statements from witnesses. The body has probed the allegations against Cuomo since mid-March. Cuomo faces allegations of sexual misconduct. At least 10 women have separately come forward to accuse the governor. Cuomo is also being probed over allegations that he directed staff to illegally withhold or misrepresent information regarding the number of CCP virus nursing home deaths, nursing home resident deaths. The governor has refused to resign, saying it's up to voters to decide who governs the state. Donald Rumsfeld, a forceful U.S. defense secretary who was initially the main architect of the Iraq war, has died at age 88. Donald Rumsfeld, the forceful U.S. defense secretary for two presidents and the main architect of the Iraq war under George W. Bush, has died at 88, his family said on Wednesday. Rumsfeld, who ranks as one of the most powerful men to hold the post, brought charisma and bombast to the Pentagon job, projecting the Bush administration's muscular approach to world affairs. With Rumsfeld in charge, U.S. forces swiftly toppled Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, but failed to maintain law and order in the aftermath, and Iraq descended into chaos and violence. Stuff happens, he told reporters in 2003, amid rampant lawlessness in Baghdad after U.S. troops captured the Iraqi capital. Rumsfeld played a leading role ahead of the war in making the case for the invasion. He warned of the dangers of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, but no such weapons were ever discovered. And U.S. troops remained in Iraq long after he left his post. Rumsfeld, who also served as defense secretary for President Gerald Ford, also oversaw the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 to oust the Taliban leaders who had harbored the al-Qaeda leaders responsible for the September 11th attacks on the United States. Twenty years later, the U.S. is in the final process of pulling out of Afghanistan. 
But U.S. forces during Rumsfeld's tenure were unable to track down Osama bin Laden. The al-Qaeda chief slipped past a modest force of U.S. Special Operations troops and CIA officers along with allied Afghan fighters in the Afghan mountains of Tora Bora in December 2001. U.S. forces killed him in 2011. Rumsfeld became a lightning rod for criticism. And with the Iraq war largely at a stalemate and public support eroding, Bush replaced him in November 2006. In Rumsfeld's Rules, his compilation of truisms dating back to the 1970s, he wrote, if you are not criticized, you may not be doing much. Another quote, equally apt, it is easier to get into something than out of it. If you're like a lot of people, you still have airline credits from canceled trips during the pandemic that may be about to expire. Now, two senators are asking the Department of Transportation to intervene. Democratic Senators Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal want the DOT to determine if placing expiration dates on credits is unfair. Existing rules give airlines a lot of leeway on the issue. They're only required to issue refunds when they cancel flights. When passengers cancel them, they're allowed to issue refunds or credits. And many airlines opt for credits that expire after a certain time. The DOT has the authority to prohibit unfair or deceptive practices, which is the guideline the senators are asking officials to look into. Earlier this year, American and United Airlines reported a combined $5.7 billion in outstanding credits. That comes after taxpayers provided more than $50 billion to airlines in a massive bailout. The Transportation Department has received more than 100,000 refund-related complaints from passengers since the pandemic started. Pennsylvania is proposing a five-cent tax on every bullet. It's part of a bill by two state House Democrats. The tax would fund a state police database of ammunition sold in Pennsylvania. It would require bullet makers to encold bullets sold in retail outlets in Pennsylvania. The serial numbers on the bullets would go to the police database. The lawmakers say they want police to have a way to solve more shooting crimes. A memo issued by the bill's sponsors says only 21% of shooting crimes in the state since 2015 have resulted in an arrest or conviction. But the director of a gun ownership group doesn't support the plan and says it amounts to registration and taxation of a constitutional right. He sees it as opening up a way for the government to confiscate lawfully owned ammunition in the future. Just ahead, Bill Cosby is released from prison after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his conviction. The public and the survivor's attorney react. A Texas high school mariachi band director retires. Right before she leaves, her band gets a first division prize in the last contest she joins. All that and more here on NTD News. Bill Cosby has been released from prison after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his conviction. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Bill Cosby is out of prison. He was freed Wednesday after Pennsylvania's highest court overturned his sexual assault conviction. Reactions ranged from outrage to cheer. He's rich, he was gonna get out no matter what. He's an iconic person and uh, they don't, you know, people don't care about sex crimes. That's kind of it. So what does it mean? The justice system doesn't care about rape survivors. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued its split decision after Cosby had served more than two years of a three to 10 year sentence. He was convicted in 2018. You can't do that to an old man that's 80 years old and send him to prison for something he didn't do wrong. But 40 years ago, he should have, they shouldn't have gotten him then when he was younger. But why now? I think they should leave Bill Cosby alone. Attorney Gloria Allred represents 33 women who accused Bill Cosby. She argued the decision didn't exonerate Cosby. I want everyone to know that I do believe that this was a very important fight for justice. And even though the court did overturn the conviction, it was on technical grounds. It did not vindicate Bill Cosby's conduct. Cosby is best known for his role as the lovable husband and father in the 1980s television comedy series, The Cosby Show. The program earned him the nickname, America's Dad. But his family-friendly reputation was shattered after more than 50 women accused him of multiple sexual assaults over nearly five decades. His conviction was seen as a milestone moment in the Me Too movement. A technicality is is not um, enough uh, to release anyone. 
with those types of charges. A lot of people are victims and they're really upset. They're really sad. It's ruined their entire lives. Cosby was found guilty of drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Costin, an employee at his alma mater, Temple University, in his home in 2004. Constin's allegations were the only ones brought against Cosby that weren't too old for criminal charges. The court's decision expressly barred prosecutors from retrying Cosby. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The NSA has responded to Tucker Carlson. He accused them of spying on him, which they've denied. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that update and the congressional response. Tucker Carlson's allegations are untrue, said the National Security Agency, or NSA, on Twitter. The Fox host accused this federal agency of spying on him, saying a government source let him know by relaying information only he would know. The NSA said... Tucker Carlson has never been an intelligence target of the agency, and the NSA has never had any plans to take his program off the air. Carlson's response. Okay, glad to know. But the question remains, did the Biden administration read my personal emails? That's the question that we asked directly to NSA officials, and again, they refused to say. The NSA is meant to collect digital information and monitor networks to protect the U.S. They're supposed to target foreign activities, but they can legally collect data from Americans with a court order. But like Carlson, some Congress members aren't satisfied with the agency's response. But what's interesting is that there is no denial that they were monitoring Tucker Carlson, even if he wasn't the target. We saw this exact playbook with Carter Page and Donald Trump, where in order to try to assess information from one person, the intelligence community will utilize authorities to go after someone else to try to ensnare their true target. Gates called for an investigation into what happened during this committee hearing. Republican Congressman Thomas Massey proposed making it a crime with stiff penalties for the DOJ, FBI, or NSA to invade people's privacy. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. A Texas high school mariachi band director is retiring after devoting decades to the Mexican folk music, and she got possibly the best parting gift, a first division prize in the last contest she entered with her band. For Marta Ocampo, music and mariachi aren't just in her blood, they are the language of her soul. Music is something that goes inside of you and comes back out. So it's something that intertwines us with everybody that's playing at the same time. The retiring band director devoted 37 years to education. She also spent the last nine years building from scratch the Soul Azteca Mariachi Band at Grand Prairie Fine Arts Academy near Dallas, Texas. And one of my students asked me if I could teach mariachi. And I said, it's music. I let's try it so we just we started practicing uh, once a week after school of a group of kids and we just started and it just got bigger and bigger now she's leaving her mariachi family to spend more time at home with her own family it's time for my family it's time for me to devote time to my husband to my daughters to my grandchildren and you know just kind of see what's up there for me maybe write a book her passion for the traditional Mexican folk music can be traced back to her family. I'm originally from El Paso. My mom used to sing when she was younger, and she sang that kind of music. And her family's love for this music has definitely passed on to her. Playing mariachi is, is so much fun. Ocampo will be sorely missed by her students. Thank you for, for bringing structure to our lives and for us uh, just stay motivated uh, through all these months and years. But they are happy for her as well. She's really made a legacy for herself. And I was like, it's really good that she's taking the time to really focus on herself and her family. And I wish her the best. Earlier this month, Ocampo's band performed in the 2021 UIL State Mariachi Festival and won the first division superior rating. It's just one of many prizes the band has won over the years, but this one may be particularly special to Ocampo because it was her last contest before retiring. Yale drama students no longer have to pay tuition thanks to a gift from a Hollywood mogul. David Geffen is giving $150 million to the Yale School of Drama. 
The donation means tuition for all current and future students is covered. It also changes the name of the school into the David Geffen School of Drama at Yale University. Geffen founded Geffen Records, which produces popular Broadway shows, including Cats and Dreamgirls. He also co-founded DreamWorks Studio in 1994. This is not the first time that Geffen gave a large donation to the arts. In 2015, he gave $100 million to renovate and rename the New York Philharmonic Orchestra's home as David Geffen Hall. Coming up, Britney Spears' case in court again. She's protesting the conditions of her conservatorship. We'll tell you how the judge ruled Wednesday. A historic California amusement park reopens, but a staffing shortage strains park management in the wake of pandemic rule changes. Stay tuned to find out more. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled my pillow. And to thank you for your support, I'm gonna pass the savings directly on to you. For example, you get my six piece towel sets, regular $109.99, now only $44.98. Or my pillow dog beds for as low as $19.99 with your promo code. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. You're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals, all at no additional cost. Plus, your zip code may have coverage with the give back benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. I call to get dental, transportation, meals, and the give back benefit. With this virus situation, I call to get everything I'm entitled to. I couldn't believe I was missing out on so many benefits. With the uncertainty of the virus, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. A Los Angeles judge again denies Britney Spears' request to make changes to her conservatorship. She calls her conservatorship abusive. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has the story. A Los Angeles Superior Court judge on Wednesday denied a request by Britney Spears' lawyer to have her father removed as her conservator. She says she works and pays her staff, but she's not allowed to spend her own money or make her own personal or medical decisions. She tells the court that her father is abusing his power over her life. Spears' father, Jamie Spears, denies his daughter's allegations. In a court filing, his lawyers said he's greatly saddened to hear of his daughter's difficulties and suffering. He says he wants an investigation into her claims. Jamie Spears became his daughter's conservator after she suffered a breakdown in 2008. While denying the request to have her father removed as conservator, the judge assigned a trust to act as co-conservator for Spears. Spears' plight has brought public condemnation of her treatment. Her case has also put a spotlight on conservatorship laws. Fox commentator Katie Pavlich questions the legal process. They said she wasn't competent enough to hire her own lawyer. But then they allowed her to be competent enough to sign her entire life away for the rest of her life as a young woman. Pavlich says that once someone is in a conservatorship, it is almost impossible to get out of it. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. A Northern California transit agency is celebrating a new class of graduates. The good news comes after the same agency saw a mass shooting in May. And today's Eileen Ng has the story. A class of graduates from the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, or VTA, completed their eight-week training program. 22 new bus operators are ready to hit the streets to help with post-pandemic service recovery. 
VTA ridership dropped 80% during the pandemic and shelter-in-place orders. Hiring more operators will allow VTA to return to normal service. The last two weeks, they've been in what we call line assignments, as they've been driving the routes of regular operators already in work now. And so with the supervision of those drivers, uh, these drivers were driving the routes and uh, with somebody behind them looking over their shoulder, making sure they were uh, on schedule and uh, not making wrong turns and that sort of stuff. Blasting Games said the training is the same as prior to the pandemic, with some social distancing and mask protocols. The new graduates will be on their own on Monday. I actually got even prayers and notes and whatnot, people saying thank you for picking me up, thanks for the masks, thanks for the sanitizer, because people need to get places. Without us, they can't get where they need to be. Like, there's people that got to go to the doctor, people that got to make it to work. You know, people love it, and I loved it. I appreciate people appreciating me. It makes me feel good about my day. Actually being live on there, picking up people, seeing the smiles, seeing the different personalities, good and bad, all over the place. It was just awesome, you know, and to be able to drive by myself to say, hey, you know what, I pick up that person to take him to the doctors or to take him to his job to feed his family is the best feeling ever. The transit says they always need more drivers due to regular turnover rates like retirement. The celebration comes after a tragedy in May. A VTA employee shot and killed nine co-workers near the rail yard. He also took his own life. It was one of the recent mass shootings in the U.S. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. California's 114-year-old Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk Amusement Park is operating with only about 1,000 employees, half the usual number for the summer season. The shutdown and lack of much advance notice about the reopening meant that seasonal hiring this year started late and competition for workers is stiff. Thrill seekers are showing up once again to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Since reopening in April after a year-long shutdown, business here has been busy and this July 4th weekend looks set to bring the biggest crowds yet. But the 114-year-old amusement park, a couple hours south of San Francisco, is operating with only about 1,000 employees, about half what's usual for the summer season. So from a staffing perspective, I mean, we'll be as ready as we're going to be. You know, we're not staffed to the level that we would like. To make sure all rides can stay open, it's all hands on deck. Executives have stepped up and are now working at some attractions or food stands. Rice, whose family owns the park, is himself taking on two eight-hour shifts a week. Like I said, I think we're going to be chasing labor or struggling to find enough labor for the remainder of the summer. As the country approaches the Independence Day celebrations that the Biden administration hoped could mark the country's emergence from the health crisis, the U.S. economy is both back to normal and very far from being so. Data shows the leisure and hospitality industry is still missing 15 percent of its jobs. Though there are several million more unemployed Americans than before the health crisis, U.S. businesses as a whole report a record number of job openings which need to be filled. At the boardwalk, the shutdown and lack of much advance notice about the reopening meant that seasonal hiring this year started months later than usual. When it did, competition for workers was stiff with all local businesses ramping up at once. As Rice expands his own workload, he's finding some unexpected benefits. I have to say at the end of a shift, I, one, I feel like I've contributed and you know I feel proud about uh, the hard work I put in that day and two, I'm really eager and excited to sit down because my aching back and feet uh, are tired and telling me that they are tired. So there's no shame in putting your feet up after a hard day's work. A flash flood caused massive amounts of mud to cover Zion National Park. It caused the National Weather Service to issue a weather warning for southeast Utah and led to a search and rescue operation. Over an inch of rain covered the park within an hour. The Quality Inn Hotel in the park was completely destroyed, but hotel management hopes to reopen the surrounding campgrounds by Saturday. Another hotel lost 30 rooms. Park management says the park's huge parking lot will be closed indefinitely. A part of a park trail was also washed away. But the park has already reopened to visitors during the cleanup. From mid-July until September, the park faces the risk of flash flooding. These floods often occur without warning and can increase water flow by over 100 times. Researchers are testing drones to help combat wildfires. The FAA is loosening aerospace restrictions for them, and the new rules are helping further the project. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the story. 
The Lubrecht Experimental Forest just outside Missoula, Montana marks a major center for wildlife research. Jennifer Fowler eyes two drones high in the sky with weather instruments. She's part of a program testing how drones can be used to fight and monitor wildfires. In weather balloons and radiosons, which measure, their devices that measure temperature, pressure, relative humidity, wind speed, and wind direction um, through the atmosphere up to 34 kilometers. We're taking those devices and putting them on unattended aerial systems. The program comes as the Federal Aviation Administration starts to ease restrictions on autonomous flight for unmanned aircraft systems. Some fire chiefs see drones as a nuisance that get in the way of tankers dropping fire retardants. Other fire departments have tested drones fitted with sensors to detect toxic gases and infrared cameras to detect fire temperature. One of Fowler's drones features an anemometer, an instrument to measure wind speed, wind direction, and air temperature. Another drone carries a payload with instruments to measure air temperature, relative humidity, and GPS. One key area in jump-starting autonomous drones is battery recharging technology. The other hurdle is getting special FAA approval for airspace. Certain drone licenses limit the aircraft to 400 feet. For the program, Fowler's team was able to fly its drones up to 1,200 feet. 400 feet's great, but it's not giving us the information that we really need long term for some of our weather models. And, and to really, even looking at wind shear, if we're trying to help some of the aircraft as they're flying through a fire, they aren't flying at 400 feet, they're flying higher. Long term, a drone must be able to change to help find routes, examine fuel loads, and weather conditions. For the next test, Fowler said her team is taking the drones to Oregon in October to test them out on a real fire, one that burns sections of the forest to keep wildfires in check. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Still to come, American mask makers may go out of business in just a few months. They're forced to compete with cheap Chinese producers. A former South Korean Marine captain and human rights advocate recounts her sexual assault and advocates for fundamental changes in the legal system. More on that in just a moment. Over two dozen American mask makers are on the brink of bankruptcy. The cause? Super cheap Chinese masks that only sell for a penny each. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on the story. Cheap Chinese face masks are forcing American companies to the brink of bankruptcy. According to Nikkei Asia, Virginia-based manufacturing premium PPE is suffering a 90% monthly production decline compared with its peak time last year. Their masks are piling up in stock, equipment idling, and staff size shrinking from 280 employees to only about 50. Premium PPE's chief revenue officer, Brent Dilley, says that for them... Selling the mask for less than a penny is not possible. American Mask Manufacturers Association, or AMMA, has data showing that the average price of China-made masks is about one penny each. The association also estimates that nearly 300 million masks are sitting in warehouses in the U.S. AMMA member Ambrust's CEO and founder predicts that all 28 AMMA members may close in the coming two to three months. When they go out of business, it's not like we turn off the lights and mothball these machines. We send them to the dump. 26 U.S. mask makers wrote to President Biden last month, asking him to adopt policies to protect the country's medical PPE industry. The letter says it's a matter of national security. It states, fight China's unfair trade practices that are destroying what we have striven so hard to build. Data from Congressional Research Service shows that in 2019, almost 72 percent of masks in the U.S. were from China. South Korean activists and lawmakers are calling for reform to the country's military justice system. Their actions come after an Air Force master sergeant accused a colleague of sex abuse and took her own life in May. Here's NTD's Andrew Thomas with the report. New details come from the family and South Korean Defense Ministry officials. The Air Force Master Sergeant had reported she was molested by a colleague in March, but her supervisors sought to cover it up and forced her into a settlement. Later, they claimed military prosecutors dragged out their investigation for nearly two months. In that time, they never summoned the alleged attacker for questioning. 
A former Marine captain, who now works as a human rights advocate in Seoul, says she was also sexually abused while serving, but decided not to report. The incident itself wasn't very traumatic for me. Similar to this case, I was shocked by all the ridiculous things that happened after that. I wondered whether I had to keep living like this, with everybody talking, when I was the one who had spoken up. The reactions from my colleagues and other female soldiers, that was more shocking. With one of the largest armed forces in the world at over 600,000 troops and mandatory service for men, the military is an institution in South Korea. Activists say the country's military authorities have not done enough to curb abuse and cover-ups, even after a series of deaths and prominent crimes led to tighter rules and harsher penalties. That's including the 2017 suicide of a female Navy captain. She said she had been raped by a superior. Defense Minister Si Wook has apologized for failing to implement the measures. The Joint Chiefs of Staff referred requests for comment to the Defense Ministry, while a ministry spokesman said it will support legal and institutional reform. President Moon Jae-in's ruling Democratic Party has also proposed legal reforms. Among them, transferring military sex crime cases to the civilian judicial system. Bong said she believes the military court system should be abolished altogether. <laughs> There is no need to stay this way during peacetime, as most of the filed cases in the military can be handled by general criminal law, and there are no war crimes to handle. She added that broader changes in the military's culture and centralized command structure are needed. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Up next, a project in Germany is test driving autonomous buses. Opening the vehicles up to the public, passengers can now book their own route with just a few taps of a smartphone. This is such a gentle painting, so beautifully portrayed. A group of people reading together in this simple, everyday-looking living room. A young girl reading along with an adult. A grandparent sitting in the lotus position. A businessman in his typical suit. You see all those people, they look like they have quietly settled down there. And you as a viewer, it looks like you've just stepped in the door. You can't see what it is they're reading, so you're a little bit curious and you're kind of invited to walk in. This harmonious feeling is not by accident. It is the very subject of the work. The book they are reading is the main text of Falun Gong, which is an ancient Chinese spiritual discipline in the Buddhist tradition. At the core of Falun Gong are the values of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. Unfortunately, the practice is banned in China, where the artist resides. Thousands have been killed for their faith. Golden energy blooms into the room as a result of their steadfast faith. The painting on the back wall reminds us of this work's title, Plum Blossoms in a Muddy World. It's also a metaphor for the practitioners that are sitting in the room as plum blossoms. They signify perseverance and hope that all brutal winters end and life is renewed once again. The magical thing. The reality of autonomous public transportation is upon us. In Germany, three self-driving e-buses have been running since mid-April. Riders can even order pickups right from a smartphone app. Here are the details. In April, the German city of Karlsruhe welcomed Vera, Ella and Anna to its regular traffic flow. These are the names of three driverless shuttle buses, and using them needs just the touch of a button. Passengers can now book any routes within the bus's test area via a smartphone app. The user has the option of interacting with our service via an app called EVA Shuttle. It's available for Android and in the App Store. And with it, you can book a ride for free. The user can simply pin drop where he wants to start, where he wants to go, and then he gets suggested rides. 
The autonomous electronic buses are part of a model project by Germany's Federal Transportation Ministry. The concept is unique in Germany. It's based on an extended sensor design that includes a radar. It builds up a 3D image of its environment to aid navigation. For safety reasons, the shuttle bus still needs a security driver on board. Sometimes we just get problems at big intersections or if a car is just parked wrong. Then, unfortunately, we have to intervene. For example, it detects obstacles that are actually not an obstacle, like grass or just bumps in the road, or sometimes water spots. If it's raining or something, then we have to intervene. The buses have proved popular, with passengers ranging from children to senior citizens eager to try out the service. And as for the future of the self-driving buses... With the concept, of course, the plan is someday, and this means several years, to get the security driver out of the vehicle, to then, for example, to allow for real 24-7 mobility, which serves also the rural areas. The test period runs until the end of July. The pandemic sent crowds of people into unemployment, but one British woman adapted to the job market while cleaning up a famous river. Here's NTD's Andrew Thomas with more. Furloughed from her job and confined to London by lockdowns, Flora Blathwip put herself back to work. She founded a business based on trash she retrieves from the muddy banks of the River Thames. Just over a year ago, she was struck by the colorful pieces of plastic she collected as part of a river cleanup effort. I went to an event uh, for World Rivers Day just before all the the lockdown pandemic started Um, and it was from there that I was so amazed at all the sort of plastic and the microplastic that that we were picking up on this beach cleanup event. Now, the 34-year-old makes and sells thousands of greeting cards each week, all of them decorated with the reclaimed material. She works on the cards on top of a part-time job for a company selling packaging made from seaweed. A geography graduate, she had no formal art training, but enjoys being outside. She finds new potential in old buttons or plastic straws while cleaning the riverbank for a local environmental charity. So when I go down to the beach, I never know what I'm going to find. Um, My eyes begin to get tuned in. It's quite meditative to like finding those little gems, those treasures, something colorful, a sequin, like something gold or sparkly. Blathwit sees her success as part of a wider movement. You know, we've got got this problem around the world. It's it's massive and we've we need big change from the top. I also think people doing Things like this, and and I'm sure far more wonderful, um, impactful things, we need a bit of both. She now produces hundreds of cards a week. Last month, she made several thousand to meet a surge in orders after her story appeared in British media. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Wild orchids have been found thriving in a Siberian forest, and researchers say the number of species they've spotted growing in large patches is rare, calling for special environmental protection. Orchids like these pink cyperpidiums, or lady slipper orchids, prefer temperate and subtropical climates. They grow in countries across the northern hemisphere, but it's unusual to find them here in Siberia. For several years, orchids appear on the surface in the form of leaves, and only after three to four or five years do they begin to bloom. That is, it takes up to ten years for an orchid to grow from this speck of dust, from the seed to the flower. It is such a very long life cycle, and for this whole patch to appear, it takes about 50 years. According to Russian botanists, just 40 of the world's 28,000 orchid species are found in Siberia, and a mere 30 of them have been found in the Novosibirsk region. Now, this little area appears to be a hotspot for orchids. Scientists researching the unique patch say they've found and recorded 14 species. Such a concentration of the plant outside tropical regions marks a rare success. Local biology teacher Yuri Panov was the first to discover them 15 years ago. I exclaimed as if I had made a discovery, like Newton who saw an apple falling from the sky. It was of course amazing. I have not seen such orchids anywhere else. He was especially surprised by their abundance. Now these woods and fields have become a place of pilgrimage. Four of the species here are listed in the Russian Red Book a document which lists rare and endangered species of plants and animals. Researchers from the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Central Siberian Botanical Garden have been studying this area since 2017. They map orchids' habitats, describe vegetation, and take soil samples. They aim to understand the ecological conditions which allow these orchid habitats to thrive and appreciate their natural beauty.
I have never been fond of botanical photography before, but in the last three years I got hooked on it right to the point of intoxication. So to say that is, now for three hours without a break I shoot with one lens, with another, with still another. Each gives its own pattern. In each pattern I am looking for certain specifics. Why there's such a diverse number of species here isn't yet known, but scientists believe the rich lime soil here may be a contributing factor. It doesn't yet enjoy a protected status, and the researchers here are hoping that will change. Researchers are also exploring how to clone rare species. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A new nature documentary is coming to Apple TV+. Plus. It's called Fathom and features humpback whales and the scientists studying their language. Now the filmmaker is sharing details about production. Whales talk, and they've been talking for millions of years. A new documentary film called Fathom introduces the sophisticated communication of humpback whales, plus the hard work of scientists who are decoding the language. The film's director explained in an interview that his fascination with whales inspired him to make the film. I heard a couple radio stories about um, dolphins, actually, and something really stuck to me, and I just started devouring everything I could get my hands on related to whale cognition, evolution, communication, culture, and the picture it painted was, it was crazier than any science fiction I'd ever seen or read. Drew made contacts in the scientific sphere and met two scientists focused on the study of whale song and social communication. Dr. Michelle Fournette is a marine ecologist investigating non-song communication among humpbacks that feed in cold water, while New Zealand-born Dr. Ellen Garland studies humpback whale song, a mating display only produced by males. The three became friends even before the film started taking shape. From hypothesis to groundbreaking experiences, they embarked on parallel research journeys across the world. According to Drew, understanding whale communication and culture does more than help educate conservation efforts. I asked the scientist, why is this important? Why is what we're understanding about whale culture and communication important? And he said, if every single one of the whales died and we were able to resurrect them, if we were able to Jurassic Park them all and plop them back into the ocean, none of them would survive. Because what has been lost is the knowledge, the cumulative knowledge, the culture that they've cultivated for tens of millions of years. And the same is true for us. We are cultural animals. He says filming in Alaska was particularly dangerous. For example, he described the challenge of transporting 600 pounds of equipment via seaplane. Not to mention a humpback whale can easily capsize a small boat by accident. But luckily for the filmmaker, Dr. Fournette came to the rescue. Everything that could have gone wrong mostly uh, did, but then, you know, Dr. Fournette knows how to jerry-rig uh, a, a, a backup inverter uh, with the electric generator, so she, like, basically saved the day and allowed me to shoot the second half of the film. Um, and everything is, and psychologically, it's, you know, it takes a toll to sort of be isolated and sort of, um, you know, for that period of time. The documentary was filmed on both sides of the globe, Alaska and the South Pacific. Drew says he shoots by himself without the help of an audio technician or producer. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 630 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan.
we have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.